Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India So this presentation will be related to pathology of the glomerulus or glomerular pathology associated with systemic diseases. So I think the glomerular involvement in systemic diseases would be better term, but we will be focusing in uh, mainly the what are the abnormality which happens in the glomeruli that leading to abnormality in the renal function and which is associated with the systemic diseases. Kidney is the main excretory organ, it has got also endocrine functions say for example, the it produces the renin angiotensin system, part of the renin angiotensin system maintenance and also erythropoietin is produced from the kidney and uh, so there are lot of these kind of uh, homeostasis uh, kidney has the major role and so that is why the any kind of major systemic disease can involve kidney either directly or indirectly. So, today the particularly the kidney involvement and important uh, diseases which we will be discussing in this class are systemic lupus erythematosus which is a common uh, systemic autoimmune diseases, diabetes mellitus it is very important because it is a huge problem in India, amyloidosis and good pasture syndrome. Then we will we will just mention some of these uh, other collagen vascular disease which can involve kidney like microscopic uh, polyarthritis or polyangitis. Wagner's granulomatosis, uh, the heroxical and purpura that is the systemic IgA disease and also sometimes the bacterial endocarditis we can touch upon. But then these are the things you have to read because they are the important one which can involve the kidney. Now, SLE or systemic lupus erythematosus is a multi system uh, disease of uh, autoimmune origin and onset is uh, acute or insidious. It is a chronic remitting and relapsing disease often febrile illness characterized by uh, principally by the injury to the skin or joints and kidney and cerebral membrane. It can also involve uh, the central nervous system. So, clinically a case of uh, systemic lupus erythematosus can go to any specialty of medicine in dermatology, neurology, uh, cardiology anywhere depending upon which organs are involved. But the, the renal involvement in uh, SLE is also very very important area because it also prognostically very important uh, for the understanding the progression of the disease. Now, it is a female predominant disease um, uh, 9 is to 1 male female male ratio 2 is to 1 during childhood and after the age and after the age of 65. So, so the uh, incidence is 1 in 700 women of the child bearing age. So, this is a very common disease in, uh, in case of women. Now, the 60 to 70 percent of the patient with SLE, there is kidney involvement. So, lupus nephritis is an important component. Probably the most the serious complications in SLE is the kidney involvement or lupus nephritis. The other other serious involvement is the CNS involvement. It, it the renal involvement is really a very, very intriguing because it differs in clinical pattern, severity and prognosis and treatment. Now, pathogenesis of these uh, SLE, I will not go into details, but basically it involves the T and B cell component of the immune system and obviously this leads to the uh, autoantibody formations, nuclear antigen and other self antigen and then these antigen antibody complexes, they cause complement activations and obviously they deposits in the glomeruli bind to the, the different components of the glomerular basal membrane. So, it is circulating immune complex deposition as well as in situ immune complex deposition both things happen and finally, it leads to renal damage. Now, WHO has classified them and which have been recently modified by ISN that is International Society of Nephrology and RPS that is Renal Pathology Society and so, WHO, ISN, RPS they are almost similar. The depending upon the type of morphology or type of alterations which we see in the kidney biopsy, we classify the lupus nephritis in the following classes. Class 1, the glomeruli appear normal in normal on light microscopically, but then when you see under immunofluorescence microscopy or EM, uh, you can see some amount of immune complex deposit, but they are almost normal. And this is very rare, you do not see these kind of cases mostly 
pure mesangial alteration here there may be uh, type 2 a mesangial widening with mild mesangial hypercellularity and type b there is a the diffuse mesangial cell proliferation now so we called it mesangial proliferative lupus nephritis type 3 or focal segmental lupus nephritis i think uh, this is looked like the typical focal segmental nephritis this may be active necrotizing lesions or active sclerosing lesions or there may be only sclerosing lesions so according to that we give them abc and there is diffuse proliferative coronephritis. So, this is diffuse proliferative lupus nephritis, you should call. Then, this is a typical uh, proliferation we see as we have demonstrated in the post infective coronephritis. It may be a segment associated with segmental lesions, it can be associated with the active necrotizing lesions, active uh, and sclerosing lesions, or with diffuse sclerosing lesions. So, accordingly, we can suffice an ABCD. Now, there will be diffuse membranous coronephritis, pure membranous coronephritis, or maybe associated with some amount of focal proliferation and then finally, you can have type 6 that is advanced sclerosing coronavirus. As the different kind of morphology we have uh, described, I think the typical morphological pattern we have discussed in our earlier cases of coronavirus. So, do not need to repeat all of them, but then some example I am giving you. So, if you see these glomerulus, here there is mostly the mesangial hypercellularity you can see and along with the normal capillary vessel membrane and there is a few focal neutrophil infiltration. So, this is a typical mesangial proliferative uh, lupus nephritis. Here if you see there is a totally a diffuse endocapillary cell proliferation neutrophil infiltration along with there are these areas where the whole capillary loop is undergoing necrosis. So, this is a necrotic lesions with these kind of nuclear debris are there in this area. So, this is a typically class 4 or diffuse proliferative lupus nephritis. The pathogenesis is that immune complex deposition in the glomeruli, tubular and peritubular capillary vessel membrane and even immune complex deposit can be seen in the larger blood vessels. This associated with activation of the immune complexes with thrombosis of the glomerular capillary. Sometimes they are may be uh, associated with antiphospholipid antibodies where the thrombotic tendency of these patients increases. Now, this is the class 5 pasnephritis. This present as a typical uh, membranous glomerulonephritis with the immune complex deposits in the capillary wall like this and the membranous deposit you can see and if you see the EM you can see them that the immune complex deposits are there in the capillary wall and mostly in case of class 5 or membranous lupus nephritis they are sub epithelia. Now, for laboratory investigations you have to do the routine urine analysis serum creatinine to see the renal function then we go for these uh, antinuclear antibody and anti DNA double stranded DNA antibody. The level of the reflex that is activity, very high titer of the ANA and DSDNA uh, can be associated with high activity. And with treatment, usually these antibody titer is worse. And complement is also very important that uh, in one three fourth of these untreated patients, there is uh, lowering of the complement. And we should also investigate these cases of antiphospholipid antibody because one third to half of these cases are associated with the APLA, where the vascular involvement is much more severe. How do we clinicopathologically correlate these cases? Now, many are asymptomatic and insidiously progressive, <coughs> many of them are not biopsied and, and then more severe histologic forms tend to have more severe clinical findings. Those which have proteinuria, significant hematuria and uh, maybe uh, the uh, edema, those cases uh, have got a more uh, proliferative nephritis, but histology cannot be predicted with certainty. The more important is that in case of many of these uh, SAD patients, if there is some um, mild proteinuria or hematuria, biopsy should be done because urinary finding and clinical presentation many situations does not correlate with the biopsy finding. No clinical feature may have significant glomerular disease on the biopsy. So, that is why biopsy is important. There are uh, the the another ad addition to the classification of WHO or ISN RPS classification that is the classification associated with disease activity and chronicity. Because see the when we see the biopsy, the glomerular morphology, the important component for the clinician is that how to manage the disease. So, if the glomerular lesions or tubular interstitial lesions are reversible, then active immunosuppression can reverse the disease. So, the renal functions can come back to normal, where whereas in situations where there is a lot of fibrosis in the tubular interstitium or many of the glomeruli undergoing sclerosis. So, they are has a poor prognosis in the sense immunosuppression may not help. So, the assessment of inflammation that is why we call it activity and the permanent damage of scarring of the fibrosis or, or we, we say the chronicity 
So, we do this an indexing of activity index and chronicity index and uh, in each biopsy which is helpful to monitor these uh, cases and treat it. Next we talk few line about Henoxcola and Purpura. This is common in children 3 to 8 years of age uh, also occur in adult and usually they are present with purpuric skin lesions and abdominal manifestations sometimes with the present with pain, vomiting and bleeding and there may be non migratory arthalgia and renal manifestations in the form of uh, hematuria. One third of the patients the gross microscopic hematuria and also nephrotic syndrome can be present. Smaller number of patients develop RPGN and onset often um, follows by upper respiratory tract infection and atopy is seen one third of these cases this association. Now, Ig deposition it can be diagnosed by demonstrating it in the mesangium sometimes with IgG and C3 and if you see the biopsy in the morphology under light microscope it vary from mild focal mesangial proliferation to diffuse mesangial proliferation to crescentic glomerulonephritis. See the one of the issue with the IgA nephropathy though IgA nephropathy in majority of the cases present with mesangial proliferative glomerulonephritis. Now, we know that IgA nephropathy can present with any morphological type of glomerulonephritis starting from the mesangial proliferation to diffuse proliferation, endocapillary cell proliferation and including crescentic glomerulonephritis. So, that is why it is very important for a particular subset of uh, diseases to do the kidney biopsy and try to see that what is the typical morphologic pattern of injury. The course of the disease is variable, recurrence of hematuria may persist after onset and most children have excellent prognosis in these cases. Now, comes the another entity which is the bacterial endocarditis. Now, bacterial endocarditis you know it is a slowly progressive disease with intermittent uh, the uh, and bacteremia or saccharotic immune complex. So, a type of immune complex nephritis as instated by complex of bacterial antigen and antibody. They present with hematuria and proteinuria of various degree. Acute nephritic presentation is rare and usually if you see the biopsy, we can see either a focal segmental nephrotic glomerulonephritis or you can have a diffuse proliferative glomerulonephritis or you can have a crescentic glomerulonephritis. So, morphologically the glomerular changes may vary. Now, we enter into the, the one of the major important uh, renal involvement that is the diabetic nephropathy. Now, diabetic nephropathy, we have two types of diabetes, you know the type of type 1 diabetes and the type 2 diabetes. In type 1 diabetes, you have 30 to 40 percent developed nephropathy and type 2 diabetes, it is 20 to 40 percent. So, basically similar. Um, so, I should not say the less common as initial slide when I prepared, I have written that, but it is also very important both for type 1 and type 2 diabetes. Now, 90 to 95 percent of the diabetic are type 2 in our country and with population so aging and increasing obesity more type 2 diabetes we are getting and type 2 diabetes accounts for 80 percent of the diabetic nephropathy on dialysis. So, that is the fact and 50 percent of these deaths in diabetic under 40 related to end stage renal disease. So, kidney involvement in, in the diabetes is a very serious issue. Now, what are the clinical aspects of diabetic nephropathy? Genetic predisposition in it is it is more common in certain ethnic populations there may be a family history and also male genders are more involved. The poor glycemic control is a very important one for renal progression. Hypertension uh, is also a very, very important cause associated with diabetes for renal damage and some people think that hypertension is most important the factor for the uh, damage of the diabetic kidney and longer duration of diabetes is very important and smoking also enhances the diabetic damage to the kidney. Genetics nephropathy occur in families. So, there are evidences the risk of nephropathy increases fivefold in siblings who have nephropathy and diabetes. Family history of hypertension increases risk. Predisposing to diabetic nephropathy can be traced to polymorphism in the angiotensinogen and angiotensin receptors, the angiotensin receptor type 1. So, that means there are certain genetic components which also predispose to development of these diabetic nephropathy. Now, the, the duration of the diabetes. See, the if Usually, the history of the duration of the diabetes is very important, but I am, I am warning you from the Indian context, most of our patients who come to the first time clinical presentation of diabetes, they say that they were all right uh, even one year back. So, our actual uh, accurate detection of the onset of diabetes in many situations is very poor. That is why normally, which is described in the literature. So, after the first diagnosis, it almost takes 5 years minimum, I think ideally 10 years to develop diabetic nephropathy. And uh, but here, 
I think most of the patients give a shorter history and the, the prevalence of the renal failure also it renal abnormality starts after the 5 years of onset of proteinuria. So, this is onset of the renal disease after diagnosing of diabetes that is almost 10 years and after onset of proteinuria renal failure starts after 5 years. The form of diabetic nephropathy the usually the classical uh, the features we describe is diabetic glomerulosclerosis and loss of renal function over time associated with proteinuria, vascular diseases of the kidney and micro and macrovascular abnormalities are very important. Urinary tract infections are associated feature which is not a typical of glomerular pathology. But you can get other changes in the kidney like papillary necrosis and increased chance of injury to the toxins like contrast nephropathy which can complicate diabetic nephropathy. What exactly see in the diabetic glomerulosclerosis is that diffuse mesangial widening secondary to the mesangial matrix deposition, increased mesangial matrix deposition is the, the features which we see and tubular vessel membrane is usually thickened. These are the two hallmark and if you see under microscope these intercapillary peripheral nodule formation is the hallmark of diabetic glomerular disease. So, this is the most important component. Uh, you have to see that they are peripheral, they are intercapillary and mesangial nodule formation. So, the, if it is diffuse then we say the diffuse uh, nodular glomerulosclerosis or it can be focal also focal nodular glomerulosclerosis. These are also described as KW lesions, acellular nodular accumulation of the mesangial matrix. Nodular lesions have peripheral locations as I have mentioned and silver positive these are all silver positive and the, the this is very important and diagnostic of the diabetic glomerulosclerosis. Now, this is more of uh, this apart from the nodular sclerosis we can have this kind of drop uh, hyaline drop in the capsular area. So, these are called subcapsular drop and if you see the afferent and efferent arteriole you can see marked hyaline arteriolosclerosis and arteriosclerosis. So, these are additional features which add to the diabetic glomerulopathy. So, these are rare exudative lesions of diabetes like capsular drop representing hyalinosis in the Bowman's capsule which I have shown you and severe hyaline thickening of the arteriole adjacent to the glomerulus which I have shown and prominent hyalinosis of both afferent and efferent glomerular arteriole is characteristic of diabetic glomerulopathy. So, you have to have nodule and along with the more of these features by which you can morphologically diagnose the diabetic glomerulopathy. If you see under microscope, uh, electron microscope, you see there is uh, diffuse thickening of these glomerular vessel membrane and you do not see any electron dense deposit because there is no immune complex deposit usually in these situations. And but then if you do immunoprocess microscopy sometimes you can get non-specific uh, uptake with the some of these immune complexes. So, the this is a more of these slides diffuse mesangial nodule formation and this is the typical nodule global, nodular glomerulosclerosis. The sometimes you can get the some amount of immune complex deposition which are uh, supposed to be non-specific because electron dense deposit you do not see. Now, the diabetic glomerulosclerosis is a major cause of the renal morbidity and mortality. It advanced to uh, or instance renal disease occur as many as 40 percent of uh, the both type 1 and type 2 diabetes and glomerular syndromes are usually non-nephrotic proteinuria. They present with microalbuminuria and then some of them can present with nephritic syndrome or many of them present as a chronic renal failure. The vascular lesions are hyalinizing arteriolar sclerosis, increased susceptibility to development of pyelonephritis and the papillary necrosis. There may be also tubular lesions which are associated with tubular insulin nephritis. Now, pathogenesis is that metabolic defect leading to biochemical alteration of this glomerular vessel membrane. There is increased amount and synthesis of collagen type 4 and fibronectin plus decreased synthesis of the heparin sulfate proteoglycan. So, there is that is why you get a non specific thickening of the glomerular vessel membrane. There is uh, in addition there may be non enzymatic glycoxylation of the protein which may lead to the functional abnormality and glomerular uh, mesangial remodeling and there is also hemodynamic changes in the initiation of the progression of the diabetic glomerulosclerosis. Hyperperfusion and glomerulomegaly is also known as a part of the diabetic glomerulosclerosis in the early stages. Then we enter into the another entity which we described as glomerular disease with organized deposit. Now, if you try to understand the uh, what are the terms glomerular disease with organized deposit. So, GDOD. Now, what are the organized deposit? I think the commonest organized deposit all of you know that is amyloid. But then there are uh, other material which can look like amyloid but not amyloid. So, if you see a normally hematoxylin eosin stain slide under microscope 
we can see that amyloid or amyloid like material deposited in the glomeruli, capillary wall, mesangium and other structure in the biopsy, uh, tubular vessel membrane, even the blood vessel wall. Now, so as a whole, as in hematoxylin neosin, they look like something deposited in the kidney, so better to, to classify them together, so glomerular disease is the organized deposit. Now, this diagram gives rise to how can go ahead with classification. So, we do congruent stain. If congruent stain is positive with applicant by refringence, so they can be called amyloid. If it is not, then they are non amyloid. And then we do immunofluorescence. In immunofluorescence, if the immunoglobulin is positive, then these amyloid like material are immunoglobulin derived. And if they are immunoglobulin derived, then we further investigate that to see whether they are associated with cryoglobulinemia, whether they are associated with monoclonal gammopathy and whether they are associated with systemic lupus erythematosus or they may be associated with other immunotactoid glomerulopathy. For that, we have to do immunofluorescence study and in immunofluorescence study, these particular cases are very important that you see, you, you stain them for kappa and lambda. So, if it is a monoclonal, then you will get one of them positive and other is negative. So, that will help you to understand monoclonal gammopathy associated with these immune complex deposits, which are presenting amyloid like material on light microscopy. Suppose there is uh, immunofluorescence is negative and if immunofluorescence is negative, then non immunoglobulin derived this kind of deposits are mostly seen in diabetes. So, that is why in routinely when we get a diabetic kidney, as I showed you this amount of amorphous material forming nodule, even they are not forming nodule irregularly, they are expanding the mesangial matrix, we should do always a congruent stain to exclude the possibility of amyloid in the beginning. So, this is the amyloid, <coughs> you can see the light microscopy, you can see the whole glomeruli are basically enlarged and they have replaced by eosinophilic amorphous material and if you do the birefringence, there is apple green birefringence, the color is not correct but then uh, it looks like that and uh, we have mentioned that there is a group of called immunotactoid and fibrillar glomerulonephritis. So, ideally should be examined under electron microscope, because electron microscope even you can detect the amyloid fibril, you can detect the other amyloid like material say for example, fibrillary glomerulonephritis, these are fibrillary deposits in the mesangium and glomerular capillary wall, they are ultrasexually different from the amyloid, amyloids are actually much smaller fibril and they are usually amorphous beta platelet structure. Whereas, these fibrils which produce fibrillar glomerulonephritis, they are congruent negative. And obviously, they have uh, 18 to 24 nanometer in diameter of fibril, they do not stain with congruent and a microscopic appearance may be look like membrane peripheral glomerulonephritis or messenger peripheral glomerulonephritis. So, if you do immunofluorescence, there is selective deposit of IgG, often IgG4 along with the C3 and kappa and lambda. Now, there is another uh, rare variety which looks like amyloid is immunotactoid glomerulonephritis. The patient often have circulating paraproteins or monoclonal IgG uh, deposited in the glomeruli. They are structurally look like microtubular and more than the microfibular and the width is 30 to 50 nanometer in width and these structures are deposited in the mesangium and glomerular capillary wall. Why I am saying that, see amyloid like deposits are becoming increasing problem nowadays in renal diseases, particularly with increase the survivability of the patient. So, many of these older generation beyond 60, if they develop the renal disease, you are getting something which is not looking like diabetic, but looking like amyloid or they may be overlap. These cases should be investigated further to classify them accurately which part of the or what is the type of the glomerular disease with organized deposit. I think with this we just mentioned the other features, good pasta syndrome, microscopic polyangiitis and organous granulomatosis, mixed uh, cryoglobulinemia and multiple myeloma. So, the all, all, all these can affect the kidney, we have described uh, the most of them and I think the multiple myeloma is the one which needs a special mention because its pathology is quite interesting and uh, the the causes of renal failure in multiple myeloma, either it can cause a cross nephropathy or it can cause a light chain deposition disease or there may be a primary amyloidosis which I have described, they can be associated with multiple myeloma, then hypercalcemia, renal tubular dysfunction, then the systemic uh, illness like the volume depletions and other nephrotoxic medicine can cause. Now, myeloma kidney typically there are two pathogenic mechanisms. There may be a lot of inter intracellular cast formation, uh, intertubular cast formation, particularly direct tubular toxicity by the light chain 
and contributing factors to the presence of renal failure multiple myeloma are high rate of light chain excretion that is tumor load, biochemical characteristic of the light chain and concurrent volume depletion. The cast nephropathy the most common pathological diagnosis of the renal biopsy of the multiple myeloma due to light chain binding to the TAM horsepole protein which is the normal mucoprotein secreted by the tubular epithelial cells. They, they actually get the, uh, the entangled and form a very, very tough uh, cast and block the tubule and these actually are more fractured, easily fractured. So, we see the fractured cast and they produce an epithelial reaction around this cast which form epithelial giant cells and then if there is dehydration, it worsens the cast nephropathy due to decreased flow in the tubule and increased concentration of the light chain in this tubular lumen. And this is the typical one, you can see the eosinophilic, these, uh, these kind of inspissated uh, cast along with this irregular fracture and you can see the epithelial cells are forming quite giant cell reaction around this cast. And this is more of that, I think this is a epithelial giant cells you can see. So, that summarize the changes in the uh, myeloma associated uh, kidney involvement. So, I think the here in this uh, presentation, we have showed that how the different uh, damages or changes occur in the mainly the glomerular and tubular interstitial compartment in different systemic diseases.